Turn in your Bibles back to Matthew chapter 18. Carrying on from last week, coming to verses 6 through 10 this morning. A message I've entitled, Don't Mess With My Kids. Don't Mess With My Kids. We live in a fallen, sin-cursed world, don't we, beloved? We expect danger, tragedy. We know there will be unavoidable accidents. We hear about occupational hazards, acts of God as they're called. But what disturbs and outrages us most are the acts of men, the avoidable accidents, the preventable tragedies for which there is no excuse or justification. We all know about the arrogance of the Titanic captain, for example, leading some 1,500 people to a watery grave, drowning or freezing in the North Atlantic because of his misjudgment. History records many other horrific yet preventable calamities. 1984, Bhopal, India, pesticide plant has a gas leak, claims as many as 16,000 lives across the region. Some half million others who are injured, all because of slack management, Deferred maintenance, in fact, it later led eight employees to be tried and convicted for death by negligence. Same year, 1984, San Juanico, Mexico, another gas explosion destroying an entire farm and a nearby town, killing some 600 people, while another 6,000 plus suffered severe burns, all because the gas detection system had not been maintained and serviced, which would have easily detected the leak. 1986, one that we all know well, Chernobyl, Ukraine. Most devastating nuclear accident in human history, spreading lethal radiation across Europe that would claim tens of thousands of lives and cause untold harm up to this very day. All because of not following instructions, poor training, faulty design, and operator negligence. One more example, 2013, Dhaka, Bangladesh. The eight-story Rana Plaza, a commercial building that housed a garment factory. On the 23rd of April, cracks appeared in the building, causing many shops to close. However, on the 24th of April, the garment workers were forced to return to work. The cracks widened and the building collapsed. 1,134 people perished under that rubble, all because the warning was not heeded. Proper procedures were ignored. Three additional floors had been added without a permit. And so we are rightly shocked at such avoidable losses of life due to negligence or incompetence. Corporates and governments spend billions, don't they, Uh, along with hospitals and other institutions, writing endless policies and drafting meticulous codes and hiring layer upon layer of management and staffing, all for occupational health and safety to prevent harm in the workplace and society. So here then is my question as we come to our text this morning. Should we do less in the church? Should we be any less concerned about preventing spiritual harm when eternal souls are at stake, right? Should we not be far more watchful in our care for our Lord's precious little ones? as we've been reading in this text, those chosen by our Heavenly Father, adopted, blood-bought through His Son. No wonder then that Matthew 18 is so graphic and specific, so vivid and detailed in teaching us about cultivating a, a culture of spiritual safety in the church. Name pitfalls that are more perilous than temptations to sin. Name dangers more severe or or risks more hazardous than those causing others or yourself to stumble into everlasting ruin and unending damnation in the life to come. Nothing compares to that gravity. Let's read the text again. Please stand in honor of God's word. Listen as I read, reminding us of the backdrop and the context from verse 1, Matthew 18. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child to himself and set him before them. 
And he said, truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. For it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to that man through whom the stumbling block comes. If your hand or your foot caused you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be cast into the eternal fire. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be cast into the fiery hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Our gracious Lord, please be our teacher. Thank you that you use graphic images and grotesque metaphors sometimes to arrest our attention, to wake up us up even as believers we need this and an unbelieving world that will not fear you that denies eternity and is oblivious to the horrors of hell but they still care about their own physical life and protection and you use pictures like this to grab us by the lapels lord Many of us here know the anguish of dear friends and loved ones who have been caused to stumble, some even into their grave and into eternal, everlasting, irreparable loss. Help us, Lord, to feel the weight of this warning, to see what is at stake, to repent where needed, to find forgiveness and cleansing. Lord, that some would find salvation this very hour. In the name of our Savior, your Son, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I pray that you are already noticing here, Jesus is taking a hard look at his men, the 12. It's like he's looking at them and through them as his disciples with their craving for place and for power and their lust for position and for rank and status and all that it symbolized, the havoc that selfish ambition would wreak across church history in countless heresies and scandals and church hurt and damaged or ruined souls. Someone said these words from Jesus here in verses six through 10 come from his mouth like a flame of righteous indignation as he considers all the wrongs inflicted on his weak and helpless little children. Friends, do you see how jealously protective our Lord is of his kids? He reserves his harshest words and severest threats for those who would harm his beloved ones. Our outline this morning is three warnings against causing a Christian to sin. Three warnings against causing a Christian to sin, whether others or yourself. And I must prepare you. There are two graphic images and then a glorious one. There are two terrifying pictures followed by a Beautiful one, briefly in closing. First we'll look at drowning, and then burning, and then guarding. Drowning, burning, guarding. First warning, verses six to seven, drowning. We'll call this a hellish image of water and woe. A hellish image of water and woe. Beloved, get this into your mind's eye. I'm so struck by the fact that he's probably still holding the baby. We just read there in verse two, he's called a child. And remember Mark added that he had lifted up that child and was probably uh, embracing this uh, unsuspecting little boy or girl who just got recruited for the lesson of a lifetime. He's got this kid in his hands while he talks about amputated limbs and maimed people and the fires of hell and breathing out brimstone and people drowning with millstones while cuddling a little one. So tender and yet so tough. So meek and gentle as a lamb and yet so fierce and in a sense ferocious 
as the Lion of Judah, full of grace and truth. We left off last time in verse 5, the privilege, and it's followed now by the duty in verse 6. From a promised reward for receiving believers, there's now a threatened punishment. You see, if hospitality toward Christians means receiving Christ and surely harming believers means attacking Jesus himself, which explains the severity of this text. Look at how it begins, verse 6. Whoever causes one of these little ones to stumble, throws it wide open, universal lessons that all must heed. Anyone who treats Christians badly, anyone who harms believers in this way. And of course, it starts with the obvious culprits back in verse 1. The disciples already in the dock. The 12 in the crosshairs of Jesus rebuke for their proud comparisons, for their uh, selfish rivalries, for inciting each other to envy, for tempting and causing each other to stumble into jealousy and, and, and anger and evil ambitions of every kind. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me. Notice, it's not unbelievers. That was chapter 17, verse 27. Peter was taught that we should not offend unbelievers in our Christian witness and tax paying and so forth. Now the focus is causing believers. It's been clear, though he has a literal precious child in his hand, he's illustrating something metaphoric and figurative. Uh, if I could remind you, verse 3, become like children. Verse 4, humble as this child. Verse 5, one such child. It's clear that he is speaking figuratively about believers, children of God. Stumbling, scandalizo is the Greek word here. Hunting language, you may recall. Baiting your animal, entrapping your prey, capturing your kill. You say, Tim, what, what sin does he have in mind here that, that believers should not be caused to stumble into? Well, the answer is any sin that would bring them spiritual harm. Any disobedience into which they would be ensnared or tripped up or enslaved or, or shackled. Not, please hear this, I've heard these kinds of texts misused too often. Causing believers to stumble doesn't mean, oh, you just hurt their feelings. Not that you would ever want to do that. Oh, oh, I just disagree with you. I have a different opinion or a preference. You're making me stumble. In my experience, those are the people least tempted to stumble because they're so utterly convinced of their own conscience or their own view on that issue. That's not the point here. This is causing a professing believer, another person who claims to be a Christian, to backslide or spiritually fall, to, to uh, stumble ultimately into unbelief, the mother of all sins, to trip them up so badly that it would lead to eternal ruin, that, that would, it would cause them to abandon the faith and prove that they were never actually saved. Back in Matthew 13, the seed sown on rocky soil, those who fall away, who prove that they were never saved, it, it uses the same word, they stumble into unbelief. Moses used this language first back in Leviticus 19. You shall not curse a deaf man nor place a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall revere your God. I am the Lord. So whether you're causing others to stumble physically or spiritually, God takes it very seriously. And he warns of the most awful consequences. Keep reading, verse 6. Whoever causes one of these little ones, believers, who, who, who believe in me, Christians to stumble. It would be better for him to, and notice he doesn't just say, ah, oh, they'd be better off dead. He puts it much more arrestingly and, and graphically, uh, grotesquely than that. To have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and be drowned in the depth of the sea. Literally, it's a millstone for a donkey. That's the Greek term. This massive donkey drawn upper millstone wheel that was used to crush the grain to produce the flour. Remember, first you'd have the winnowing fork and you would winnow out the chaff from the wheat in the wind on the open hill side and then you'd bring 
the wheat or the grain onto this lower millstone, and then you have this upper millstone as wide as my arm or wider, connected by a wooden beam on the harness or yoke of a donkey who would then move in circles as no man could do with uh, much greater strength, causing this wheel to grind the grain underneath to produce the flour. And so there you stand, a criminal in the ancient world, notorious for your crimes, perhaps a public enemy of the state or some infamous criminal. They load you up in the boat in chains. They sail you out to the middle of the sea. They tie a triple knot around your neck, only to find that you see that rope is connected to this old, worn out, no longer needed, enormous millstone, only to find that behind it, it requires three or four men, upon the executioner's word, shoving that stone overboard, violently yanking you to a watery grave, plunging you down to a place of no return, an immediate, inescapable doom. One of the most gruesome, feared, and disgraceful forms of death. No funeral, no burial, no, no mess to clean up. Your entire memory erased at the bottom of the sea. Shark food and fish bait. Song of Moses come to mind? When God defeated Pharaoh and his enemies in the Red Sea, Exodus 15. Lord, you blew with your breath and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. An explicit image but actually, it's a parable and a mere picture of infinitely worse torments, right? An eternal drowning in another lake of fire. An actual place, the promised destination of every unbeliever and pretend believer. If anyone causes these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Genesis 12 comes to mind. God's promise to Abraham and his descendants. Whoever blesses you, I will bless. Whoever curses you, I will curse. Zechariah 2, you harm God's people. You're touching the apple of, what? His eye. The most delicate and sensitive and exposed part of the body. You harm God's kids. You're poking your finger in the eye of the Almighty. You are irritating the Most High in heaven. And so for any such culprits who do that, Jesus announces this very stern and severe, harsh warning. You'd be better off with a quick drowning than to face the true fate that awaits you in a long, long stay in eternal hell. As one writer puts it, every believer is a child of God and like all children needs protection, care, and understanding. It is an enormous crime to harm even one of them by leading them into sin to ruin the character of a saint or to retard his or her spiritual growth is heinous in God's sight because it amounts to attacking his beloved son, Jesus Christ. And notice now verse seven. What follows is an appropriate double woe of divine judgment and condemnation. The first woe is more generic. The second at the end of verse seven is more specific. Look at the text. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. You could say, alas, how terrible these temptations, how awful these traps, how horrible these apostasies, how fatal these, these falls, and, and, and how lethal these scandals. But you might ask, Tim, why does he say woe to the world? I thought this was a warning to the church. But then you have to remember, when the greedy disciples were... Uh, 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 having selfish rivalry with one another, who were they resembling? And when we fall into childish competition and fleshly behavior towards one another, whose control have we come under? Answer, the world. The satanic world system. The, those who scandalize the church are clearly of the world, as First John often speaks, not of God. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. First John chapter 2. All of this proud ambition that launched this whole discourse in chapter 18. Keep reading verse 7. For it, these stumbling blocks, is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. 
It's a fallen world, so people will, will keep falling. As long as sin exists, there will be sinners. As long as the tempter roams the earth, temptations will abound. As long as the deceiver exists, there will be deception. Until the father of lies is drowned in the lake of fire, there will be lies that torment the church and false doctrines that trouble believers and theological error that ruins and harms the visible church and a host of sinful lusts and desires that destroy souls. Now look at the second woe, the end of verse 7. Yes, it's inevitable, but woe to that man through whom the stumbling block comes. In other words, no excuse for enticing others. <laughs> no exemption if you were the agent of another or a believer stumbling, ever. doesn't matter how sovereignly predestined, how divinely decreed, how providentially ordained evil and sin is, the perpetrators will still pay. Yes, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. But that doesn't for a moment exonerate you for being his instrument of evil. Remember in the prophets in the Old Testament, they would often say to Assyria or Babylon or King Cyrus, you're the rod of God's judgment on the Jews and then you're going to boast about it and he's going to judge you for being his rod, which he planned to be his rod, while he holds you fully responsible. And the Bible never apologizes, never blushes, never is ashamed to put those truths side by side. And here we have in one verse a fine summary, a single verse theology, a brilliant summation of the doctrine of divine compatibilism or what we also call concurrence, that God is absolutely sovereign while simultaneously at the exact same time and man is fully responsible. We dare not let go of either truth. Divine certainty, human culpability. You think you have to let God off the hook? You dishonor him. You think you have to let man off the hook? You obscure the gospel. It's inevitable. And woe to those through whom it comes. Not the only place. Jesus speaks in the same vein in Luke 17. It is inevitable the stumbling blocks come, but woe to him through whom they come. Luke 22, speaking of the cross. Indeed, the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. God sovereign, man responsible, both. Acts chapter 2, the early church preached this way. This man Jesus, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, while concurrently, without any incompatibility or contradiction, at the same time, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Who did it? God or man? Yes. Yes. Acts 4, the Christians prayed this way. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus. Both Herod, Pontius Pilate, Gentiles, the people of Israel, these are guilty murderers of Jesus to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. Brothers and sisters, we should take comfort in this text. There's a reason, there's two exclamations in the uh, NASB translation of verse seven. Every agent of Satan, every tool of the devil, every source of temptation in the world and in worldly churches, all these guilty unbelievers will answer one day and they will pay and none will get away with it. How about Hollywood? All those handsome and gorgeous actors, celebrities, movie stars, every last one, unless they are saved, will answer for how they, probably perhaps like no one else, have destroyed civilization as we know it, ruining countless marriages, destroying homes, with godless ideologies, and massive sexual revolution, propagation of every worldly philosophy known to man. Planned Parenthood will answer. The entire abortion enterprise for leading even professing Christian mothers to murder their precious babies. Billion dollar porn industry will answer on that day for preying upon our youth, create an entire society of sex addicts, a generation of voyeurs who objectify women and fantasize of every conceivable debauchery. Sangomas, 
the inf- all the influencers of animism and African traditional religion holding this continent captive in fear and superstition and darkness? They will answer. Publishers, producers of every kind of print and digital media, all the social media outlets will answer for every bite of information that they platform and spread to defile hearts and minds across the planet. Every advertising agency, they are stumbling specialists. You pay them millions because they have perfected the art of bait and switch, hooking you, the consumer, with well-disguised lies about what you need and what will satisfy you. Woe to those who cause stumbling. Aggressive gay agenda, transgender perverts, redefining marriage, grooming children, promoting bodily mutilation, leaving our youth butchered and broken, deceiving millions with their homosexual lies. Educators, governments, schools, colleges, universities, all will answer for making millions as the Bible warns. Walk in the counsel of the wicked and stand in the way of sinners and sit in the seat of scoffers despising God's word, taking souls captive with hollow and deceptive and Christless philosophies. Friends, where do we stop? Time fails us. Uh, What about the enormous global influence of the secular music uh, industry of all kinds or the fashion industry ensnaring billions with their satanic lies about what the good life really is and what's uh, a real beauty and, and, and what it means to be human. Uh, how about the corporates and the economists and, and the philosophers and the artists and the culture makers and the culture shapers of every kind, the lawmakers, the politicians, all the corruption, all the lies, all the murder, the judges, the magistrates, they'll answer. Oh, in the video game industry too, in the alcohol and liquor industry, in the smoke and vape industry, and every other industry that damn souls will give an account to God. Woe to them. Woe for what they do to souls, precious souls, in the church who claim to be Christians. Some of you sitting here right now, all of us to varying degrees. Psychology with all of its lies, on and on the list goes. Scripture is clear, however, there's even stricter judgment for Christian leaders, greater accountability for church authorities who led the church into error, who made professing believers stumble, causing spiritual ruin of the worst kind. Every Joel Osteen and Joyce Meyer, every At Bosshoff and Ray McCauley and Joseph Prince and Shepard Bushiri, every T.B. Joshua and T.D. Jakes and Lechanyani and Shimbi, and many, many more who have lined their pockets and will burn in the hottest fires. Teaching and living in such a way that others want nothing to do with Christianity. Scholars creeping into churches and seminaries, undermining the authority, the infallibility of Scripture, making students doubt the Word of God. Christian parents who live a double life of hypocrisy and their children grow up hating the church. There's a story of an alcoholic father once. He snuck out of the house in winter, late at night to go to his favorite tavern, but hadn't gone far before he heard a soft crunch, crunch, crunch noise in the snow behind him. He turned to see his six-year-old boy a few meters back. He says, my boy, what in the world are you doing out at this late hour? His boy replies, following in your footsteps, daddy. In your footsteps. How about Christian young men who tempt a girlfriend to deny the Lord and live immorally? Christian women who dress immodestly, act seductively, leading brothers in the Lord astray. Whoa, whoa to them. Better off drowned with a millstone. One writer adds this application. Spouses and friends, co-workers and fellow church members indirectly can be caused to stumble into sin by being treated in insensitive or unloving, unkind ways. How about flaunting our Christian liberties in what we eat or drink or wear or any other aspect of legitimate freedom in Christ that that there's nothing the Bible forbids, but doing it is proving harmful to the souls around you. Do you think that's important in the Bible? Three whole chapters are devoted to this issue. Romans 14 and half of 15, 1 Corinthians 8 and 1 Corinthians 10. 
all about what do I do with my liberty? All things are permissible, but not all things edify. Remember Gentile and Jewish believers causing one another to stumble in the early church? Judgmental and self-righteous on both sides. You have the Gentiles uh, criticizing the weaker Jewish believers for still refusing to touch pork or holding strictly to their Sabbath, even though Christ has come and freed us from those old covenant ceremonial laws. And then you have the Jews, on the other hand, criticizing the weaker Gentile believers for refusing to eat meat sacrificed to pagan idols, which are no gods at all, and there's no moral, spiritual uh, value in the, in the beef. Both sides missing the whole point. It's not about food or drink or days. It's about protecting the consciences of your fellow believers. About not letting your liberty become their license. You take an inch, they go a mile, as we say. Not letting your example lead to their downfall. So they're tempted to violate their conscience, to ignore the alarm bells and end up backsliding or apostatizing. Romans 14 sums it up. All things indeed are clean, but they're evil for the man who eats and gives offense. It's good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything by which your brother stumbles. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy, blessed is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith. And whatever is not from faith is sin. Let's work on this today, in our home, this week in our homes, in our small groups. Let's get real practical and discuss a kind of theology of stumbling. Uh, and... and uh, how to develop more of a church culture of spiritual safety and keep learning how to build one another up and not tear each other down. Funny how you hear the rumors about tow truckers who must have tampered with the robots, you know, or the traffic lights and turned them in another direction or a road sign, you know, to cause intentional injury and even fatal accidents. Oh, how dare they! And yet in the church we do it all the time with our sin. Jesus' words take us down deep to survey an ocean floor littered with skeletons tied to stones so that we would heed his warning. Never forget this graphic and hellish image of water and of woe. Number two, from drowning we come to verse eight and nine, burning. And we'll call this a hellish image of fire and amputation. A hellish image of fire and amputation. And you wonder, what does this teacher have in mind when he wants to impress upon our imaginations crippled and lame and one-eyed people? It reminds us of Ezekiel of old. In his prophecy, Ezekiel 14, God says, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts. They've put right before their faces the stumbling block of their iniquity. Should I be consulted by them at all? And in that same vein, Jesus now turns, notice, from a focus on causing others to stumble to yourself. From the law, uh, the, the, the speck, can we first remember the log? <laughs> and, and while we're noticing that however sovereign God is, it's inevitable, but holding man fully responsible, can we start with the root beneath the fruit, your own sin? Because if you can't deal with your own temptation and your own uh, selfish desires and your own sin, how are you ever going to protect others and care about the holiness and the godliness of others and not causing them to stumble if you can't stop yourself from stumbling. I think that's the logic here. And we're going to actually treat verse 8 and 9 kind of as a whole here. Uh, it might sound like deja vu to you. <laughs> it must be important because it's almost verbatim what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount about adultery of the heart. It seems to think we need to hear it again. Drastic action is called for. Making no provision for the flesh, as the Apostle Paul would put it elsewhere. Let's read the text again, verse 8. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It's better for you to enter life crippled or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be cast into the eternal fire. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be cast into the fiery hell. 
Nathan rebukes David for his sin once. You have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Deal with your own sin first so that you won't be causing others to stumble. It's hard to calculate, beloved, the amount of harm, the extent of damage done by just one undisciplined Christian, one hypocrite in the church, a single two-faced pretend believer, just one chameleon Christian who lives a double life. Think about it. It, 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 it's, it causes untold harm. It gives fuel to the scoffers and the cynics. It provides an excuse for fence-sitters to not come to Christ. It pushes away an inquirer who was seeking after the Lord. It, it discourages the saints in a myriad of ways. As J.C. Ryle sums it up, this hypocrite, in short, is a living sermon on behalf of the devil. I want to quickly summarize this second warning, burning, with uh, three, a sequence of three uh, uh, points, three aspects here under uh, the second warning of burning. Temptation, amputation, and motivation. Temptation, amputation, and motivation. Looking at it more topically or conceptually, you could say. Temptation begins, as Bunyan calls it, what is that first gate into the city of Mansoul? to assault the human heart. It comes through the, the eye gate, right? Jumping down to verse nine, if your eye cause you to stumble, and what lures in your eyes, soon your hand and your feet follow. So I think going with the logic here, verse eight, your right hand, notice, your right foot. That's the language Jesus uses uh, the first time back in Matthew five. It's your hand, it's your foot. Uh, try living a day without it. Let me know how that works. <laughs> it's, it's vital, it's precious, it's prized, it's your treasure. It, you depend on it. And now he, these are the temptations. It starts with the eyes, through the eye gate. It shows in the hands and the feet. Let's think about that temptation. Often in scripture, the lust of the eyes uh, Eve in the garden with the forbidden fruit, she saw that the tree was good for food. It was a delight to the eyes. Scripture warns about following after your own heart and your own eyes. It talks about eyes that play the harlot, the eyes that are unsatisfied. Ham was cursed because when his father naked, Noah was naked, he looked upon him. Lot's wife was turned into a pillar of salt because she looked back at Sodom. King David was on his rooftop that day and he saw beautiful Bathsheba bathing. Achan, Joshua 7, the reason all of his sons and every one of his daughters and all of his possessions were stoned and destroyed by God. From his own mouth, Achan confessed, when I saw among the spoil the beautiful things, then I coveted them and took them. Let your eyes look directly ahead, Scripture tells us in Proverbs 4. Let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. Watch the path of your feet. Don't turn to the right or to the left. As a brother in Christ would often say to me, Tim, to stay pure as husbands, or if you're single, preparing to be a husband, bounce your eyes. Don't let them land until they land on your wife, until you're married. Bounce your eyes. Win the battle visually. Temptation comes through the eyes follows with the hand and the foot, and now from temptation we have amputation. Shocking, intentionally gory and bloody, deliberately gruesome imagery here of maimed and dismembered bodies and severed limbs lying on the floor because of some sharp-edged instrument. Cut it off, verse eight. Throw it from you. Verse 9, pluck it out. Throw it from you. It can't be literal. You don't solve a spiritual problem with a physical solution. You don't fight a spiritual battle with material weapons. Hacking off the fruit without addressing the root achieves nothing. Fine, get rid of your right eye. You can still lust with your left one. Get rid of your right hand and your right eye, literally, and you'll still be a tool for Satan. Hide all the women in the world behind burqas and thick veils. Tell me how that's going in the Middle East. Because the human heart is the 
polluted fountain from which all the filthy springs flow. We must deal with the source of our sin, but Jesus calls us as well to address our behavior and to remove the temptation and the stumbling. It's not either or. Colossians 3, in the language of Paul, probably with Jesus' warning in mind, put to death. Treat the parts of your earthly body as dead to sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, greed, which amounts to idolatry. Colossians 3, verse 5. I don't know how to put it more plainly than this, beloved. Jesus is saying, no holds barred on your war against sin. No limits on what you will forsake or deny yourself of to defeat sin. As the Puritans would say, kill sin or sin will kill you. Make every effort urgently now, today, or else holiness is not for the faint-hearted or passive. True salvation is not for the timid or the weak. Christian sanctification means you don't tolerate sin. You don't toy with temptation. You don't flirt with immorality. You don't pander to lust. You don't even go near her door, the scripture says. Take drastic measures. Deal radically with your sin and with every temptation. So it's as hard as possible to sin next time. You may have one eye left, you may have one hand left, you may have one arm left, but as you limp and hobble and stumble your way there, it wasn't as quick as last time. (laughs) That's the illustration here. Whatever stands between you and holiness, between you and a pure heart, between you and a godly life, tear it out, rip it up, cut it off, and throw it far from you. Deprive yourself or else you will be eternally deprived. And by doing this, however costly, however painful, you show your faith in Christ is real, that you are in his kingdom. It's how we work out our salvation. It's not so that we can be saved, it's to prove that we are saved. The Bible doesn't so much teach, oh, once saved, always saved, got my fire insurance, eternal security, signed a card, prayed a prayer, I'm good, live how I want. The Bible teaches more of if Saved, always saved. Am I persevering? Am I enduring? Yes, by his grace alone, through faith alone. As I mortify sin, to use the old language, the doctrine of mortification, of killing sin. Think of yourself as a newborn child of God who still has the flesh, remaining corruption, indwelling sin, and imagine that you are covered with petrol or kerosene or gasoline. Would you go near a spark? Would you come anywhere near something that would ignite you? God forbid. Flee. (laughs) Never trust yourself. Some of you, it's DSTV. It's your Netflix account. It's your YouTube habits. It's your TV, your PC, your phone, your tablet. Others of you, it's certain websites or news lists or email subscriptions. For some, it's certain social media. Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, etc. For some, it's your entertainment choices. You can't handle those movies. You have no business listening to that kind of music. Some, it's your gym, it's your spa, CrossFit, the place where adulterers meet, <laughs> from what I've heard. Exercise club, soccer, rugby. Fine. Let them call you extreme or cultish or fanatical or, or mentally unstable. We'll see in eternity one day. Certain roads you drive, billboards you could avoid, places you eat, drink, visit, spots you go to on holiday, beaches, pools, restaurants, impure friendships, worldly companions, dangerous relatives, ex-girlfriends, ex-boyfriends, workers you travel with, employees, employers that you could avoid, neighbors you should not frequent. If your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. Today, as soon as you get home, if, what, what do you need to eliminate or remove or banish or destroy from your life to flee temptation, to rescue your eternal soul, to avoid causing yourself or others to stumble and to win the battle for holiness? And then third, we said there's temptation and amputation under the second warning of burning. And then there is motivation. He doesn't blunt it. Jesus doesn't beat around the bush. He takes the gloves off. It's better for you to enter life crippled or lame than to have two hands and feet and be cast into eternal fire, verse nine. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be cast into the fiery hell. 
Unchecked sin leads you to hell. I repeat, unchecked sin leads you to hell. Giving in to temptation does not bring lasting pleasure. It doesn't satisfy. It incurs eternal torment. That's how deadly and powerful sin is. If you don't get it under control, if you don't rein it in, it'll drag you down into the lake of fire. You are in the fight of your life, friends, a fight for eternal life. The kingdom of heaven is at stake. I don't know how Jesus could be clear. Better to go to heaven without that right hand, that right foot, that right eye, than go to hell with it. (laughs) Better to go to heaven without those friends, those devices, those idols in your life, than go to hell with them. People say, oh, but I don't know how I could live without Wi-Fi. Well, I'd rather you live out without Wi-Fi now and go to heaven than end up in hell forever because you kept your (laughs) Wi-Fi. Or whatever else you need to amputate. Oh, I can't live without this pet sin or that cherished lust or that precious relationship or or this incurable addiction or this bad habit. No, Jesus says, stop saying you can't live without it. You can't live with it. It will damn your everlasting soul. A.W. Pink says, alas, this doctrine of hell, a powerful deterrent to evil, a motivation for holiness, it's rarely heard anymore in, in these degenerate times. When today, little else in the pulpit is heard than honey and soothing syrup being handed out. Where are the sermons today calculated to make sin-hardened souls to tremble? My unsaved friend, if you're here today as an unbeliever, don't know if you're saved. Praise God, we're glad you're here. As simply as I can put it, the message of the Bible is turn or burn. That's it. Turn from sin or burn forever. Flee the wrath to come, scripture says. And if you refuse to hear that warning, if after this sermon you still reject Christ, you delay in being truly saved, your blood will not be on my hands, it will not be on our hands as a church. You cannot say you did, we did not warn you of a hell to lose and a heaven to gain. If only you would give your life to Christ today. If Christians believed hell existed, that Jesus plays for keeps and means what he says, there'd be a lot less sin and stumbling and causing others to stumble, wouldn't there? Living in light of eternity makes a huge difference, doesn't it? Again, this isn't about earning salvation. This is about proving salvation, right? If you're living according to the flesh, Romans 8, you must die. But if by the Spirit you're putting to death, murdering, killing, mortifying the deeds of the body, you will live for all who are being led by the Spirit of God. These are are sons of God. That's why our catechism says, what is sanctification? It's the work of God's free grace, whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die unto sin and live unto righteousness. Praise God, we're not alone in this battle. My brother, my sister, you have the strongest helper, the most powerful assistant, the Holy Spirit himself, living inside of you, the the indwelling Christ within you to strengthen you for this battle in the local church here, exactly the kind of things we need to focus on tonight in our prayer meeting and should drive us often to our knees. Lord, instead of me being a stumbling block to others, make me a stepping stone. Make me someone who points others to Christ, who helps others draw near to the Lord, who is an example worth following, an encourager and a Barnabas in the, the lives of others. Number three, we've seen drowning. We've seen burning with temptation, amputation, and motivation. Now we come briefly. Verse 10. Couldn't leave you with only two hellish images when Jesus now shifts gears to a heavenly image. Let's call it a heavenly image of angelic protection. A heavenly image of angelic protection. A celestial, glorious scene here. Verse 10. See to it. Take heed, beware, watch out. Pay attention that you do not despise. The word here means to look down on believers, on other Christians, to insult or disregard them, to devalue and think lightly of them, to treat them as insignificant, to to treat Christians with scorn or, or belittling or minimizing. See to it that you do not despise one of these little ones. Why? For I say to you that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Wow. 
their angels. Key phrase here, don't miss it. Many have said from Jewish and Christian history, this is the verse for your little, whatever her name or his name is up there on the clouds, your guardian angel. That is going beyond what this text says. And I think there is better news and greater comfort than that in this verse. It is what their angels is what we call a collective pronoun. It's talking about general corporate protection. God has a uncountable group of angels protecting his redeemed, the church. Not one for one, but all of his angels doing his will for all of his church. (laughs) We're not worse off. We're better off without a single guardian angel. The Lord doesn't need any angels. He carries out his sovereign will through his omnipotent arm as he pleases, but he's chosen often to use angels in his service. We're coming to this on Tuesday night in theology class in the Lord's perfect timing. A myriad of ways, and this is one of them. You couldn't have better guardians assigned to your care. You couldn't have a better security system, (laughs) A, 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 a stronger set of bodyguards attached to the child of God. Not guardian angels, but guarding, guarding angels. A whole garrison of heavenly troops commissioned to protect you and me. Are they not ministering spirits sent to serve believers? Hebrews 1. He shall give his angels charge over you, Psalm 91. I love the way Spurgeon puts it. We speak of dragons, but we do not know much about them. And we do not know much about angels, but we feel sure that angels can overcome dragons, for they are more than a match for devils. And if mysterious temptations come to you, child of God, there there shall also be mysterious defenders to thrust them back. You have more friends, poor Christian, than you realize. When you are fighting the battles of God, you may hear a rush of angels' wings at your side if you have only your ears divinely tuned. God would sooner empty heaven of all the angelic hosts, cherubim and seraphim included, than allow any one of his people to suffer defeat." Elijah, remember 2 Kings? Behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about him because he stood true to his Lord. Or as Luther once put it, our best friends are invisible. (laughs) Our best friends are invisible. This is Jesus' point here. Don't despise any one of these little ones because in the very presence of Almighty God in the throne room of heaven, The angels are doing his will and advocating for his people and protecting his church. Don't mess with my kids. (laughs) Any mistreatment of of believers will not go unnoticed in the highest court, the most important place of all. You injure, you despise one of my children, you're fighting against heaven itself. (laughs) Don't don't miss the image here. These uh, spectacular angels right before the very throne of God and, and Jesus, the Son of God, sent all the way down from heaven to, to save and redeem through his blood these same precious uh, uh, children, God's elect, and the face of the Father in heaven smiles. Smiles on his angels, smiles on his son because they're devoted to the care of his elect, the redeemed, his little ones. How could you have a more eloquent argument, a more powerful appeal than this? In other words, we're back full circle to verse one. You naughty disciples. You selfish followers of Christ. You professing Christians. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Seeking selfish greatness while heaven is concerned about God's glory and the good of the church. Repent of all your vain ambitions. Stop your self-seeking. Instead, put on the meek and gentle spirit of heaven May the love of God for fellow believers, his children, fill your hearts. Drowning, burning, and guarding brings Jonathan Edwards' teenage resolution to mind when Edwards said, resolved that I may live as if I had already seen the torments of hell and the glories of heaven. And then he would pray, Lord, stamp eternity on my eyeballs what Jesus is doing for us here with these three striking images from the hellish scenes from below and a heavenly sight from above that ought to be indelibly imprinted upon our hearts and minds. I'll close with just a simple analogy. (laughs) You know how businesses reach parents in the consumer world by spoiling their kids, right? 
Love my kids, you love me. Massive jungle gyms and jumping castles at restaurants, that's not because the owner is back there just feeling all warm and fuzzy about your kid. <laughs> it's because he knows his customers. How much more? How much, much more should we care for God's children for the sake of not money but the sake of eternity and for the sake of his son and the price that he paid and for the sake of pleasing our heavenly father? Don't mess with my kids, he says. Let's pray. Gracious Father, forgive us for not living in light of eternity. Please give us more of this eternal perspective. Cause us to feel more of the weight of these warnings. Teach us to love Christ, to love Christ's little ones, Christ's church more, to hate sin more to take greater caution about anything that would cause ourselves or one another or other believers to stumble. Teach us instead how practically you've given us 52 different one another's in the New Testament. Teach us how to build one another up, to encourage one another daily while it's still called today, to, to spur one another on towards love and good deeds, to continue to excel still more as we've been learning in 1 Thessalonians on Friday mornings in Ironman to excel still more in love and care and concern and jealous protection and unselfish regard and a very personal interest in the spiritual welfare and the, 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 the well-being of our fellow members in the body of Christ and the souls around us and entrusted to our care. Save any who are lost here today. Rescue them from the damning grip of sin through the power of Christ. In his saving name we pray. Amen.